about injury prevention and we start to look at the different things that arise from running, I think that one of the common terms that you hear with like running injuries is that there is a overuse injury, right? So people talk about running as being this common overuse injury. Um, and really, I think as you look at a lot of the data that comes out of all the running research and stuff, is that the there's very few overuse injuries. A lot of it is just under recovery, okay? So you didn't necessarily use something too much, you just didn't set yourself up, right, to be able to do it by recovering enough between the last one. <laughs> so when we start looking at all of the different things that you can do for recovery, basically you've got a couple different tools in your tool belt to look at recovery. So you've got sleep, right? You've got nutrition, um, but you also have the intensity of the workouts that you're doing. And so that's where it becomes really, really important to get good at training to the intensity that's prescribed by the plan, right? And not sort of like racing other people in the group. And you know, the beauty of running is that you can do it at your pace and still be doing it with a bunch of fun. Okay. So you're never never let yourself feel like peer pressure to run with somebody and keep up to a certain standpoint. You're running the same training plan as everybody else, but at your pace to where you are on that day. And that day might be different one day versus another. So sort of look at basing it on your heart rate for your intensity. And so we talk about like having that conversational paced run. And generally you're looking at somewhere around under 80% of your max heart rate. Now, there's general rules for your max heart rate, but if you go out on Saturday night, have a whole bunch to drink, and eat a whole bunch of greasy, not so great food, and then wake up on Sunday morning and come, your heart rate, that resting, because your resting heart rate is gonna be higher, you're not gonna be able to do as much. If you push yourself to be at the level where you were before, you're gonna to have to compensate some more. So your form might break down, something else is gonna absorb all that extra stress, and that's where you start to feel these little aches and pains and other things gone. So that starts to become a big thing, is paying attention to how much rest and sleep that you're getting. Um, so the like average human being, just like no arguments, like not, you know, everybody pretty much needs at least eight hours of sleep to function as a near normal, like, wake up, go to work, functioning human being, okay? Uh, then you're gonna add training on top of that, all right? So roughly, you want to set aside at least nine hours a night for sleep, okay? Uh, yeah, so that always sort of like gets everybody, you know, shocked. Uh, and I think that everybody has like a different situation, they have different things going on, all these different things, but um, it's really important for the success of your plan that everybody at home is aware of the fact that you have this goal and that you're training for this and that this sleep thing is not just you like trying to get out of doing dishes after dinner, right? Which could be, but um, <laughs> you need to get that in and so it's important that you have like a support network at home of like people that are like, hey, go to bed, okay? Uh, and that you really stay on yourself, all right, about that because if you start to get into like sleep debt, right, it doesn't work like what they say in college where you can just like sleep all day Saturday and make up for the week. Um, you pretty much can't get sleep back. So you can, it's really unfair too because you can build up debt and things will get worse and worse and worse, but you can't ever like bank sleep and you also can't make up for it. Um, so not getting enough sleep can only have negative effect, you can't go the other way. And this is actual sleep and not like I go to bed for nine yes. hours and I only slept for seven. Right, exactly. Uh, so this is like in sleep mode, you know, and the other thing is sort of like, you know, your like different devices that you might use are gonna measure your sleep based on when you stop moving and when you start moving. They're generally off by somewhere between a half an hour to a half. 
So if your garment says you got eight hours of sleep, you probably got around seven. Uh, uh, if you really want to be looking at your body temperature and all sorts of other factors to measure your sleep, uh, so you really want to keep track. The garment can keep track of your resting heart rate, um, and keeping track of your resting heart rate, you see that start to climb up. It starts to be a sign that your body's not recovering from the stress that you're putting on it. And so then you want to start to look at either putting less stress on it, or getting more recovery, or my advice is to you. Okay? Uh, anybody have any questions about sleep stuff? No? So the other thing I started talking about this is uh, nutrition. And so we'll do a lot of different stuff on nutrition and all the, all the different aspects of nutrition as we kind of like work through the plan. And people have specific questions or whatever. But um, however many, so I, one thing is you don't want to be losing weight while you're training. Okay? If you find that you're losing weight, Okay, then it means you're not putting the nutrition <coughs> nutrition back in that you burned out, right? And so your body doesn't have the fuel to rebuild the stuff that's broken down and just more things are gonna break down. Okay, so you know, I don't know, I'm ironic about this stuff and I weigh myself every morning. Um, and if I start to see the number going down, then I know I need to up my calorie intake. So you don't want to be losing weight while you're training. Uh, if you have like a goal of like weight loss and this is something you want to do and whatever, that's great. Just not the same time, right? Now you don't want to do it at the same time. Uh, you'll you'll probably end up like you know your body fat will go down, but your muscle mass will go up while you're training for this thing. Yeah, so things are going to change. Okay. Um, and that's all fine, um, but that that number on the scale should, if anything, like I like to see to, to be safe. That like over the course of like a 16 to 18 week training period, I like to gain two to three pounds um, because then I just know that I'm not losing. It's just better to be safe than sorry in that one. Can I just train this a moment? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, no, 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 no. So right now. I am not toned at all. Like, I haven't been running probably two months since Boston, okay? I feel like blood. Okay? I weigh the exact same that I do when at the end of my marathon training. At the end of my marathon training, like, these pants will be, like, slipping off. So it's the muscle versus fat ratio thing that's going to happen. So your body, you're going to see a change. But just, yeah. Okay, I just want to make that. So I'm not thinking you know, pound, pound of muscle and a pound of fat, take up a different space. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. I know, because that's... I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. I know. So you're saying I can eat a pint of ice cream after a long run? You <laughs> can. Actually, I was just reading something yesterday, and I haven't finished the article. Yeah. Yeah. Like, skim milk is a really good thing to drink as soon as you're done running. Oh, I like chocolate milk. Well, that's actually even better. The chocolate milk, too, but... There's, there's some studies to that. Um, the other thing, nutrition-wise, that I always tell everybody, um, go out and get um, some tart cherry juice. Um, there's all sorts of research behind tart cherry juice. It's just really well studied and everything. Um, it's a great natural anti-inflammatory. Um, it also has like melatonin producing things. So you have eight ounces of tart cherry juice at night before you go to bed. Uh, and, uh, yeah, right? it'll, help, it'll help you like get to sleep a little bit. Uh, but it's a really good sort of, I call it just like free, but you obviously have to buy the cherry juice. But um, it's, it's just a, like there's no cost to that. It's not like you have to, there's no side effect like Advil or any of those sort of things. Um, and so you just take it. It's a really good, just sort of like natural anti inflammatory. You're going to be running, there's going to be impact, your joints are going to inflame, right? That's all natural and part of the process. Anything you can do to bring down inflammation down on your own is just a good thing for you. Make sense? Uh, all right, so we got sleep, we got nutrition, all right? Uh, the next thing that I always sort of like to talk about here is just your shoes and just your overall general kind of like body self-care type stuff as far as making sure that you're taking care of yourself going through this. So basically, you know, if you're like, if you're going to like a Yankee game or anything like that, like, 
these guys like treat their like love and their bad and all like, like you know it's like probably better than their kids something. Um, and so the idea is that those are their tools to do their job, right? And for you, um, your shoes are your tools, um, as is the rest of your body. So um, you don't want to be wearing your running shoes also to like the mall or anywhere else, okay? Um, they are just for running. Um, and you want to have at least two pairs, okay? If not, more than that. So generally, you kind of like look at the mileage thing, but what I used to say is once you start to get to 20 miles in a week, you need at least two pairs of shoes, and every time you go up to 10, you should add them. Okay, so if you're running 40 miles a week, you want to have like four pairs of rotation, okay? And then what you do is you run in one pair and then just like stick them in the back and then just keep grabbing the next pair, okay? The idea here is a couple things. One, that you will learn something you like better and something you don't like as much and you get a good way of going through. Also, if you look at the shoe, okay, if you have the same thing on all the time, that's your contact point with the ground. When your foot hits the ground, okay, that's going to dictate how those forces go up through your body. If that thing coming in contact with the ground is always the same, those forces are going to always be the same. They're going to always go through you in the same way and everything. And so if you vary that up, you're going to vary up the way those forces go through your body. Right? And so if you have, you know, a pair of one brand and another pair of a different brand, so the more you can vary it, the better. So I usually say like different brand, different model, the, the, you know, far off as you can get, um, and just rotate through them. Try not to say like, okay, these are my long run pair, these are my three mile, you know, just sort of try and keep it as random as possible as you're going through it so that you're really controlling the way that those forces are being placed through your body. The other thing that happens is the shoe itself, like the foam in the bottom of the shoe, takes time to re-acclimate to not having you smash on it all the time. Um, and so if you run on like Tuesday night and then you go and run on Wednesday night and you're wearing the same shoes, they're not as effective at absorbing force on Wednesday as they were on Tuesday. And so if you can vary that up and kind of like let your shoes rest a little bit, um, then they will last you longer uh, and do a better job for you while you're working. Does that make sense? Do we have any questions about that? No? All right, so the last thing that I talk about is um, you're gonna feel all sorts of different things as your body <laughs> starts to adjust to the load that you're putting on, okay? Um, and you're gonna notice little random things, okay? Uh, like, so my thing is like, I have a really low blood pressure, and when I start doing any sort of like structure training long term, if I stand up quickly, I pass out. And my wife thinks this is hysterical and laughs at me all on the floor, and then sometimes helps me up and sometimes not. Uh, but I quickly learned that like, when I'm training for something, I need to stand up slow. Uh, and so you're going to learn little different things, all right? Everybody's got their own little things that kind of like break down on them. Um, when I first start getting into like a training cycle, my right Achilles just like gets on fire. It doesn't matter what I do, what I straight train, what happens. It's like my body's way of acclimating to the load. As long as I don't ignore it and push through it and, and I pay attention to it, then within like four weeks of training, it's just normal, okay? You're, you're intentionally applying a load or stress to your body as a way of making it stronger. And everybody, different parts of your body are going to adapt differently to that. But it's really important that you sort of come up with a way of having an early warning sign to you of something that might come up, but also an idea of what your baseline is, right? So it's pretty easy for me to know that when I normally stand up, I don't pass out. That one's like a simple one. But, all right, uh, what I like to try and have people do is a couple of things, and basically, you want to find some way throughout the day, okay? to just do this every day. And then if it's one day something hurts or is hard to do or basically you were able to do it on Monday and on Wednesday you can't do it, okay? That's gonna warn you that somehow your body is not adapting to the stress that you're putting on it in a positive way and that you need to make a change. 
before you have pain. Right? So I like to tell people that pain is the last sign that there's a problem. And it's generally the last sign to come and the first to go away. So it can play tricks with your brain because you will say, one, I'm fine, I don't have any pain. And really there's something going on. Or you'll say, I'm great, that pain went away. And really you're not, right? It was just the first sign to go away, but the, the issue is still there. So the first thing that I try and tell people to do is get down into however low you can get down into a squat and spend some time at the bottom of the squat on a regular basis. Right? And so if you come down, don't knock the sock wall down, right? Which, that sounds awful. Yeah. And so if you just sit down into like this position, okay? And like I can see, like I recently started to like up my mileage and I can feel a little pull in the back of my calf. Now, I didn't feel anything when I ran this morning. I didn't feel anything all day at work. Everything felt fine, but like there I felt something. So I know I'm going to give that a little bit of attention later today. And really all you're doing in this position is bringing a whole bunch of joints at the end of, you know, your lower extremities to the end of their range and seeing how they respond to being in a position they're not really in a lot. And so your body's going to have a way of sort of hiding things when you're standing and walking and moving because your brain knows you got to do it all day long no matter what. And so it doesn't want to be in pain all day, so it kind of finds a way of working around it. But if you get into a position that you're not accustomed to, then all of a sudden your brain just, what happened here? And it's going to alert you to things that it might otherwise sort of like not tell you about. Okay? Um, the other thing is to stand and balance on one leg. Alright? So everyone always makes fun of my like stand on brush your teeth every night on one leg. Um, but one, most people do not brush their teeth for long enough each night. They just like rush through it at the end of the day. Unless you have one of those like two brushes that tells you when like you've done each one. Uh, but if you Stand and brush your teeth, you know, like a minute on the bottom teeth, and then switch legs and do a minute on your top teeth, okay? If all of a sudden something hurts when you're standing and balancing on one leg, or you can't do it, it's a good sign to you that like, hey, hopefully, when you brushed your teeth yesterday, right, you that on a regular basis, uh, you were able to balance, and then all of a sudden today, you couldn't balance. It's just an early warning sign to say like, hey, what's going on? What's happening here with me? And what can I, you know, do about that? Um, and so we got squat, right? Balance on one leg. Uh, and then the other one that I like to use is sit on the floor and stand up, right? And so I know like, if you go through, as you go through the videos, I'll be like, sit on the floor and stand up without using your arms and using one arm and all these exercise things. But um, just get down on the floor and get up. Got no rules about this one or whatever. Just be on the floor and get up. Uh, and this is one of like one day when I somehow like win the lottery or whatever, I'm gonna do a research study. Um, but I think this is one reason why people who have dogs are always like healthier than people who don't. Because you sit on the floor with the dog and get up. And when you can't get up off the floor, you recognize that there's something going on and do something about it. Uh, unless you're like us and let the dog sit on the couch with you and then it's a little separate issue. Uh, but in general, if you, if you, on a regular basis, spend some time sitting on the floor and getting up, if all of a sudden you have pain when you get up or notice that you're like, hey, you know, yesterday I sat on the floor, right, and I just like put my hand on the side of the couch and stood up, and now I'm like leveraging my body off the floor with my arms, that's a sign that something's different and something's not right before you have pain. And then it's usually a really simple, hey, you know, we notice when you're running, that your legs are crossing over the midline, don't do that anymore, boom, you're fine. Uh, as opposed to like, well, there's all the swelling in my knee and now there's all these other things going on and you need to start altering things. Uh, and so that, those are the big ones. So squat, balance on one leg, get up and down off the floor. Medication, pain relievers, thoughts. Nothing positive. Uh, so there is a ton of like well-documented research on the negative side effects of any sort of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory and more negative information on cortisone in combination with run. Um, they weaken ligaments um, and tendons and joint structure and all this stuff um, and also will hide something going on. Make sense? Um, so, yeah, no good. You want to feel what's going on. Um, if you do have like 
you know, there's all other things like if you have pain that keeps you up at night and all these other things, Tylenol is okay. Uh, there's other negative effects of Tylenol, uh, but not so much specifically running. Uh, and as long as you follow like the rules of the bottle, you're okay. Uh, Advil and leave, not so much. Uh, those non-steroidal anti-inflammatory things don't go well with running. Um, Do you want to talk about the pain scale that you use? Yes. That's so, a prompted question. <laughs> he planted me. I did. I forgot about that. Uh, so you're going to feel different things when you're running, right? And some things are going to feel less pleasant than others. Um, so there's a couple things you like to pay attention to. So um, pain that goes away, like you start running and something hurts and you, you run through it a little bit and it goes away. Keep going. No big deal. Nothing to worry about, right? We're not really worried about those sort of things. Um, pain that seems to progress while you're running, you want to start to pay attention to that. It's getting worse while you're running. Um, if it's not there at rest and you feel fine, you start running and it starts to build up, that, that's a lot of times a technique issue or a, like, I'll call it, like, load greater than capacity. So whatever the stress you're putting on your body is greater than your body's ability to absorb that capacity. And maybe you're not putting your body in the ideal position to do that. Right? Um, but I have to use sort of like a traffic light system with me. So, zero to four is a green line. Go through it, right? Run through it, weight lift through it, whatever you might be doing. Okay, the rule, these rules like apply to like lights in general, not just running. Uh, four to six out of 10 is a yellow line. Pain starts to get towards that midline, past that midline. We want to start to pay attention, look at it, See what's going on, see what's causing it, see if we need to alter some things. Overlap, so you start to get to 7 out of 10 and up. Red light, stop, go for it. Okay? That is where you're going to start to damage tissue and go through. Um, a lot of times people have these, I'm going to stick to my own terms, under recovery type injuries, right? They feel like they're tearing something, get like, you know you're very rarely actually damaging tissue in your body, okay? Um, most of the time, it's your body's way of saying, I can't handle the load you're putting on me, you need to alter this load. So, if you alter that load, all of a sudden your body becomes happy with you. So okay? Very rarely are you actually damaging tissue. Any other questions? Anything I did talk about that someone wants to learn more information about? No? All right. We are good.